One second. I'm so sorry. Hi, sorry about the confusion earlier. Hey, everybody. This is Andy Revkin at the Columbia Climate School. And a little bit late getting a show together. So you're watching me in less competent mode than usual. This is the Columbia Climate School webcast with everything going wrong at once. I'm still here with some folks on the uh, research expedition through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with the Alvin. Hold on one second and we'll get this all a little more coordinated. Uh, uh, Karen and Anna Michelle, and the, you have to unmute. I think you're muted. Uh, press the unmute button on your on your um, consoles. For some reason, they're showing up as muted. Sorry, that's better. I hear you. We're actually our next to each other, so it's going to be a little confusing. It's okay. Can you hear Sometimes us? Sometimes okay? life is confusing. Yes, I can. Um, yes. So let's get this going. I'm so sorry to everybody in the audience. Uh, and um, I'm in rural Maine. I was on another webcast, and I had forgotten to give the right link to my. Uh, the wonderful scientists and artists and communicators on this expedition, uh, the right link to the studio. So we're kind of running a little bit behind here, and I hope you're all uh, able to hear me. I'm also on uh, Elon Musk's Earthlink, I mean, a Starlink satellite system. So even though I'm on solid ground, I might have the less good transmission capacity here. But let's just start going here right away. I'm so sorry again earlier. Uh, for the uh, screw ups, but uh, we are here. And let's just hear from you right away. Anna Michelle, maybe you could start if you can hear me. You're also muted, I think, right now. So try to make, remember to unmute. And uh, just tell us where you are and, and, the, and what vessel you're on. And, and then we'll get to, uh, it, we'll, we'll dive in, so to speak. Great. So I'm Anna Michelle, and I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm also the chief scientist for the National Deep Submergence Facility. Uh, the National Deep Submergence Facility operates three vehicles. Alvin, which is our human-occupied vehicle that um, we'll be talking about today. We also operate uh, the ROV Jason, which is a tethered vehicle. And we operate the AUV Sentry, which is a vehicle that um, we send out autonomously um, to do things like map the ocean floor. Um, so we are on the RV Atlantis. Um, we're sailing with Alvin. Um, Alvin, again, is our human-occupied vehicle. We have just finished um, several weeks of work. Um, I've been on the second leg of this cruise working in the Mid-Cayman Rise, and we are currently transiting uh, towards Florida uh, to demote the ship um, on Friday. Amazing. So I guess one of the first questions is, and maybe we'll just introduce everybody too. Uh, you're, Anna, you're with Sabrina. Hello. Douglas, and you're from the Cayman, Cayman Islands? I am. I work for the Department of Environments through the Cayman Islands governments. And we have Karen Romano Young, who's an artist and author and illustrator and doodle bugger, uh, who's been on this webcast before. And you are with, uh, I think it's David Davis from, is it Rutgers? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, PhD Rutgers student. in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. Is it true? Hi, Did Andy. I see some? Hi, I'm Karen. I'm out here Hi. as an artist at sea and working on a book about deep sea exploration and um, doing some ship to shore communications like this one. Fantastic. And again, I apologize for. Can't hear, can't hear you. Yes, it's because I, it's because of the gaps in the internet uh, access I have here. Okay. I, it froze briefly. So let me stop the um, video here for a second that's streaming. Hold on. Um, what I'd like to know first is why uh, the human occupied part? You know, we're the same questions arise around. Uh, the missions to Mars and the moon, uh, 
we have all these gadgets now. We have ROVs. And what is it about sending people down, Anna, that's crucial? It's a great question. And okay. For the last about 20 years, just ROVs. And this is actually amazing, Alvin. Um, and so that question was at the top of my mind for the, for the whole cruise. And I have to say that it was so incredible to be on the seafloor. Your spatial awareness is very different when you're using a five vehicle when you're there. Um, with Alvin, we can actually go much further distances than we would if we were using an RO. Sorry, I think we lost you for a second. Um, so on the seafloor, um, being able to direct the operations um, gives you gives you a whole different awareness than you would have um, if you're using an ROV. Sure, I I don't doubt that. I was on a um, in the early '90s. I was uh, I wrote about um, one of um, a, a dive on the Lusitania. I was out in Ireland on a ship and. It's it's very clear in looking and reacting and seeing things that having that capacity to be sort of adaptive would be really much harder with an ROV. Did you did you? Yeah, I'd also add that I, I that on my last dive, I, I almost cried. It was just so beautiful to be down there, <laughs> and I think it was just like the magic of being there. You know, it was very different than. I mean, I love ROVs. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, I've used them for about twenty years. Um, but it was, you know, it's just a really different, a different feeling to be there in person. Wow. And Sabrina, what's been your activities on the ship so far? Uh, I have done a lot of the underlays for Top Lab so that um, they can send it down to Alvin. And then in Alvin, uh, when you dive, you can get all the bathymetric and the contours and the target points that where Alvin will be going to so they can have that um, and kind of go off of that map. And then after that, um, they get all the data from where Alvin has been to the actual uh, GPS points. And then I can take that and put that into GIS and map the actual path that Alvin has taken on that dive. And uh, Sabrina, what got you into this? In other words, when you were growing up in the Cayman Islands and or elsewhere, how did that bring you to this point? What What is it about deep sea science and uh, the like that caught your passion? Um, I've never really thought about deep science per se as much, but um, just all marine life has been such a big passion for me uh, since before I was 10. So I learned to dive when I was 10 and that really stuck it for me. When I mm. went down on my first dive, I said, that was, that was it. Marine life is, is my passion and that's what I'm going to do. Um, so I've been doing kind of that. In Sorry, again, the freezing is probably more on my end than your end. Uh, Karen and David, can you hear me okay? David and Karen, can you hear me okay? David and Karen, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry for any of the, sorry, uh, sorry the lags. And, like, and let me just, okay. And I guess, right, try to keep muting and unmuting. Yeah. That'll help. So, Karen, we'll get to your your artwork in a minute and your impressions of these projects. But, David, uh, same same question for you. Um, there's so many fields. Let me just hold on. Let me just mute. The, whoops. I'm trying to mute the other microphone. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. This is. For anyone listening, if you haven't lived on a ship before, I, I lived on a sailboat once for a year and a half, and everything at sea is more complicated than on dry land. 
and everything in a rural area of Maine is more iffy also. Uh, so David, back to you. Yeah, I think I saw on your website that you're working now with uh, Yair Rosenthal. Is it? I saw Yair's name. Did I get that right? Uh, hold on, uh, I gotta unmute you. You have to unmute uh, Karen. Karen. Uh, Catherine Lawson. Yeah, good. Um, in the environmental sciences uh, department at Rutgers. Um, but yeah, but he, he was my advisor coming in to, uh, to uh, Rutgers, yeah. And so what drove you toward the oceans uh, and the, 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 sorry. I'm sorry. What? Uh, actually, ask your question first because uh, I think it'll be, uh, be easier to answer than providing clarity. Sure. What drove you into this particular field of inquiry you're in now? So just describe your PhD work and and you know growing. I know in my own life, growing up in Rhode Island, I got to swim in the ocean, and Jacques Cousteau was this character. <laughs> who you probably know, who elicited unbelievable excitement about the undersea world. Uh, you know, my bar mitzvah present that I still own is my U.S. diver's mask from his company. So I know what drove me into the ocean, but what drove you into the ocean? And then the specific question you, you're most focused on. Um, my introduction to, uh, you know, so my, my scientific interests um, uh, revolve around uh, planetary uh, science. And my main project at Rutgers is looking at how uh, microbes influence how salt crystals precipitate. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to use that as a biosignature on Mars and Celtus Europa, but that's where my interest comes in. Research, um, internship at Hui um, for for uh, two summers, and that was my introduction to deep sea research. We toured the Atlantis. I got to see Alvin. Um, went to a talk, and um, and then I was able to make the connection between. Oh wait, there are hydrothermal vents on Earth. There may be hydrothermal vents on Enceladus in Europa, and um, things just kind of went from there. And I I, I looked for oceanography departments and um, science that, that aligned with that interest. Sorry again, my, my link I think buzzed out there. So how has it been so far? Had, uh, actually, David, had you been on a, uh, on a cruise before? No, no, it's my first cruise, yeah. How's that going? It's going great, yeah, I love it out here. It's, it's really awesome. And I it's, miss. I'm, it's, been I miss. With, um, it's been great to interact with um, scientists that have done this before. You know, ask questions. Um, I'm learning a lot. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a great experience. Um, so, Karen, again, you're an artist and illustrator. What? <laughs> but you don't have to go to sea, right? So, what what inspired you to spend a chunk of your professional life documenting? activity at sea on these kinds of cruises. Oh, you're um... about 15 years ago. And the first cruise that I was ever on was on Atlantis and Alvin. And I absolutely fell in love. And for the last uh, decade, I found every opportunity I could to get aboard to actually work about deep sea exploration, about mapping the technology that gets the responsibility of having to identify where the interest is. And then what we found when we got there and what we're still finding today, we're so excited because Alvin is going to a new depth that he's never been able to go to before. Just on our cruise, 6,500 meters, we're getting to the deepest part of the Atlantic and the deepest part of um, the Caribbean and just seeing incredible
a lot to learn and we need more people. Is there, are, have you, any of you, do you have the capacity on your screen to share some, anything that you've been seeing? If, if, if not, I can go to the blog. Um, on Instagram, which is the best? Um, give me one second, I can probably pull this up here. Yeah, uh, let me just see if there's any questions. If, if anyone has. Uh, Sorry, once again, I had hoped to have a better link today, but it's just not been feasible. Um, there we go. That's not the right one. Sorry. Andy, I'm, I'm in the backstage. There you go. I could try to share a video if that would be helpful. Yes, that would be great. And again, I apologize. This has um, not been. You should hit the share screen thing and then it, it'll pop up in a way that I can share it as well. In the meantime, I'm showing uh, something from the website. Karen, have you gotten to go down in the submersible? Um, yeah, in other years okay. I have. I have not gone um, down um, yet this um I was, I dived in uh, Alvin on the East Pacific Rise at one point and in Guaymas Basin, which are very different um, areas geologically and um, in, their, in their appearance too. The East Pacific Rise has big black smokers, um, incredible um, wildlife out there. Whereas Guaymas has massive structures that look like mushrooms or they call them pagodas that have flows going up on the bottom of them so that it almost looks like a mirage in the desert. It's really quite incredible. It's, it's just an amazing opportunity to be able to, um, to be. I think we've kind of frozen here again. I'm so sorry. And it's not on the part of the uh, Atlantis or the Alvin. It's, it's, I think my connection, it's a, it's a stormy day, a rare rainy day here in Maine these days. And uh, that's maybe interfering with the internet bandwidth. I'm not hearing you right now. Uh, oh, I see your- Andy, I'm not sure you heard what I said. I heard part of it. That you'd you'd you know a lot of it comes through. So even the audience for the audience they're hearing you even if I freeze. So keep in mind that if I freeze oh, up. Oh, dear. Andy, can you hear us? Your yes, I, I can. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Did you so, hear anything I just said? So, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, you were describing on a previous cruises how you yes, had, yes. you had gone down and seen some amazing. Uh, yeah, sites it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I again, I was apologizing profusely for the, the communications uh, challenges here, both on my end and maybe perhaps on the ship too. Uh, so, David, when you think about planets and well, actually not just planets, but moons, like there, there's moons in this solar system that are not our moon, that have an ocean, or at least one that has an ocean. H how has this cruise stimulated your thinking on those? more basic questions about planets and dynamics involving liquids? Well, um, I think one, one, one um, aspect that is, I think, more, most prominent in my mind is that um, there are um, 
there are life forms that are pressure adapted on this planet, right? And um, with our ocean, the deepest part of our ocean is 11 kilometers. On Europa, the deepest part of their ocean may be up to 100, be up to 100 miles or, uh, you know, 100, uh, you know, more than 100 kilometers, right? So yeah. I'm wondering if there is, wow. um, it's, 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 it is beyond our pressure adaption, right? And, and which is interesting to think about. That's one thing. Um, but then I, I start to think about, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a geochemist. I like to think of myself as a geochemist. But there are um, questions about um, what type of, because these vents on these other moons might be so deep and there's more pressure, less gravity, more, more, more pressure, how is that changing how these high temperature fluids are moving through the crust on these on these uh, on these on these worlds um chemistry I'm, I'm, I'm guessing would be a little different um how far are these plumes going because of less gravity maybe more pressure you know it's just uh, just some simple thoughts that I've, some simple things that i've been thinking about um since i've been here yeah great and i and thank you again for coming back in uh dr um Michelle and uh, Sabrina from Cayman Islands. So thinking about, oh, here, I think I've got your screen here. Let me uh, edit. Here we go. So Anna, maybe you could uh, walk us through a little bit of this. And uh, I'm sure those out there who are watching, I see a couple of good questions that have come in already. So uh, I'll, I'll bring those up in a couple of minutes. And you have to unmute. Uh, well, yeah, there we Sorry, go. I thought they were going to unmute. You should be okay. Turn your volume. So this is the BB vent. It was at about 5,000 meters deep. And what you can see is like that black um, smoke coming out. And we call it just that. Exactly. It's, it's black smoke, um, which is basically particulate matter. Um, you can see those white particle things on there. And those are shrimp that are on the vents. Now, these vent structures are very tall, something about 17 meters tall. So they're they're very they're very large um, structures. Wow. I can and, share another video if you would like. Well, hold on that for a second. Um, what's really remarkable about the vents is that even just I think it was 20 or so years ago when they were it was discovered that there are such things. That there, we know so little about the ocean floor that uh, the, we're just beginning to understand some of these dynamics, right? Yeah, there's a lot to learn still about these different environments. Um, it's, it's very difficult to do a research cruise and to get a vehicle out. So collecting samples is, you know, it, it's a big part of this and making measurements in these environments. Um, you know, it's we only have so many research vessels. We only have so many underwater vehicles. Um, ship time is very expensive. So, it, you know, when we get out to these environments, we want to do as much science as we can. And we usually bring together a collaborative team of biologists, chemists, geologists, um, and we work together to, to try to understand these sites because there's a lot There's a lot to know. Um, I've worked at several different vent sites, and this one that we went to, the BB vent, was just unlike anything that I'd seen before. Um, these very tall cathedral-like spires almost um, were just... You know, they, they reminded you of Dr. Seuss land, um, just the, the the craziness of the towers. Um, if you'd like to, I can share a different video if that would be sure. something you guys would like to see. Sure. Um, let's see if it has popped up. I think we need to switch, stop sharing. Okay. While you're setting that up, I could uh, bring up one of the questions that a, re that a viewer has for uh, Karen. Um, Aviva Romani, who's here in Maine, uh, an artist who thinks deeply about climate and sustainability, says, question for Karen, do you and your colleagues think that your work goes beyond documentation to observe new insights? In other words, what is it about the artistic or communicative process that does any of that feedback in ways that change the inquiry itself? I guess the biggest thing for me is that when we're documenting, we are um, looking at the fence and looking at the technology that we're using and all of that. But mostly for me, I'm looking at the people who are involved. I'm interested in the relationships between them. 
um, one microbiologist who works on bacteria getting together with someone else who works on hormoniferins to create um, a little trap that can go down to the bottom of the ocean that they can come back and get in a couple of years. And they decide that their, um, that their goals are linked enough that they can collaborate on this um, tool that they can put to the bottom of the sea. And I'm able to be there at their shoulder, listening to their conversations, watching them adapt this instrument so that it can work for both of their objectives. And it's just, it's very cool. I'm also interested in all the people on the ship. I'm interested in everybody from the, the wiper in the engine room to the captain, the way up in the bridge and everybody in between. Um, Allison, who's here helping us out with our broadcast and everybody all day long who is Whoops. Um, so I'm showing pictures, I'm telling stories, I'm creating comics, um, and I hope that through those different media, I can reach different people who aren't as scientifically minded um, necessarily and um, appeal to them and make them think that they have a place here, that their interest has a place, and that they themselves could get involved in this kind of a way. That's so important. I'll show some of your comics in, in a minute. And thanks to all those out there who have had the patience to uh, deal with the uh, technological questions. There was a uh, direct couple of comments came in from the from the Caymans, uh, directed particularly at, Sab at Sabrina. So I'm just going to show those again. Uh, Pam Rivington Douglas, watching from Cayman, Sabrina, mom and dad. And um, Ernesto Eduardo de Varganes. Oh, oh, he has uh, brine pools in Europe. I will have to get back to that. I'm not sure what the connection mm -hmm. there is. Um, so, but back to this video. Sorry, Anna, uh, Michelle. Uh, could you just describe a little bit about what we're seeing here? You can show it again. Yeah, this is a Dumbo octopus that was, um, the video was made at a depth of um, almost 6,000 meters. Um, so it was one of our sites here in the, the Mid Cayman Rise. And it, as you watch the video, you, you might be able to tell like the octopus, there was a change in color throughout the video. Um, and it was just a really beautiful moment where um, two of our observers were down in the sub, actually looking um, about the geological features of the site and also looking at what kind of macrofauna live at this site. Um, and they were able to find uh, this beautiful octopus and were able to sit there and make this, this video, um, watching it living in this environment. Fantastic. Um, let me just switch over to the, um, the Twitter feed, which I think, again, social media has a big downside, but through Instagram and Twitter, uh, those on the, the vessel and, uh, and also including, uh, Karen have been able to convey what's going on day to day. So maybe Karen, you could tell us a little bit about Derek. Yeah, Derek's our captain. He's, he's our hero. And in this picture, he's holding um, a, a little tiny cup that used to be a full-size coffee cup. And it's oh. made of styrofoam. So when it gets carried by Alvin due to the ocean floor, all the pressure of the deep sea um, pulls just all the air out of the cup and makes it um, a really cool little cute cup souvenir. So this, this one's for his four-year-old daughter. I just thought, um, you know, he's under a lot of pressure in his job, too. So, you know, he doesn't crack and we need to do our cops. It must be. Uh... Sorry, it's on my end again, I think. But it must be humbling and unnerving to go down to that depth obviously your cabin is pressurized to keep up with the outside pressure but knowing what those forces are like must uh what does that feel like for anyone here who's been down uh, let, let us know Sabrina, why don't you talk um actually it i don't know it just didn't really dawn on you like i in going down in the submarine i thought that you could actually feel yourself descending um, 
down that fat because you're going at a pretty high rate. So you're going at like 35 to 40 uh, meters per minute. And you just, you sit in that, in that sub and you're not really feeling any pressure. It's the Alvin sub actually corkscrews down. You're not feeling any of that. And it's just, and it's completely dark outside. So it's, you, do, you actually, if you don't really think about it, you could just be sitting in Alvin in the hangar and not really know. Um, but if you think about it, it's, it's pretty an amazing feeling. Um, being able to go down those depths and you look out the port, the window and, you just see all these bioluminescence shoot up because you're going so fast and it's it's in a really amazing sight and the thought of going down that deep is pretty amazing. And Dr. Dr. Michelle, when you mentioned getting emotional and almost being in tears, was there a particular what was the vista at that point? Um, was it was that the BB bed that I showed earlier. Um, it was just it was just so phenomenal to see that in person. Um, in my own research, we develop instruments to study environments like that. We study the fluid flow. We particularly study methane and carbon dioxide. And so I purposely didn't do any science on this cruise because we were out here to verify the sub. And just thinking that, you know, that, that this is an opportunity to come back um, one day and try to do some, so my own science at this site, you know, it's just really amazing to be able to see this, the structure. And, you know, I kept reminding the pilot, don't break it, don't break it, because it was so beautiful that, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't want it damaged in any way. It was just a phenomenal looking looking site. And just so imagine those fluid is coming out constantly. Um, it, it was just really moving. That's just extraordinary. Yeah, I'm showing again here. This is, could you, do you know this clip? This is Alvin Dive 51. Yep, so is that's it, exactly the dive I was talking about. Oh, so the that's same the one. BB, yeah. Yep, that's the BB vent um, field. You can just see that black smoke coming out, but in other locations, which you can't see in this video, there's clear fluids coming out. So there's just a lot going on at the site. Different places we went to, we saw different things. There were areas where there was an area called the Shrimp Gully um, that somebody had named before. And it was this clear fluid coming out and lots of shrimp living in that area. Um, we went to other places and there was just full of anem anemones. So it, it was just interesting in this one area that, you know, it wasn't that big but there were all these different things to see. And it was just, you know, incredible to see all of that. Oh, and I think I recognize this guy. <laughs> so, so David uh, Davis, when you get back to Rutgers, uh, I'm not sure if you're, are you actively involved in teaching at all or, or just uh, dug in on your research? Uh, oh, yeah, so I'm I, I'm not teaching at all right now. Uh, I have a uh, NSF GRP, so I, I don't. The need to teach isn't there. Um, you know, most I think sometimes a lot of graduate students are TAing or, uh, because they they you know it's they, anyway. But that's um, so I don't teach, but it's mostly just research. Yeah, and I'll reach when I can. But it it sounds like you're. What do you think about the outreach part here? You know, in a way, everything. Uh, you're all doing to reach out to the community that's not on the submarine and not on the ship is a form of uh, edification and education. Uh, are you, is there a way to help? Can I help you convey this going forward? What, what can we do uh, to sort of make sure people are actively um, sort of absorbing the key lessons that devices like Alvin and the initiatives like this project, which is, as you said earlier, basically testing the technology, but um, that we're all engaged with what it um, reveals going forward. What can we do to make to, to make this even more effective? Um, I think um, targeting young audiences, right? I mean, I think that's one thing. I mean, other than you know being as uh, as as um, diligent with like reaching out to people, yes, but um, I think getting younger audiences interested in this sort of work, right? Um, right. Because I think sometimes, you know, um, we adults are kind of stuck in our in our lives and yes, we have interests and, and, and but if it's, you know, not in the day to day, the, you know, it's, I hate to say, but most people kind of on, on you know, survival mode or, or just automatic uh, autopilot. So I think kids, kids dream, 
kids um, aspire to, to, to do these sorts of things. But I don't know one child that doesn't want to be an astronaut. And this is uh, very close to that. So, um, and, and it's exploration. You know, and exploration is exciting. Um, so I would say that the main thing would probably be just to reach out to younger audiences and um, make sure they're engaged and interested. Um, yeah. Um, I, I was just from Twitter again, showing uh, some rock samples that were taken from the uh, flanks of the Puerto Rico trench around 6,000 meters down, which is uh, again, extraordinary to think about. Uh, the moon rocks get a lot of press, but the seabed rocks maybe less so. Uh, what does this work feel like for you all? Um, maybe back to Anna. Yeah, I think, so I'm not a geologist by training, but I do love looking at the rocks. Um, <laughs> I was joking the other night that um, the lab was like the Smithsonian Rock Museum. We had so many rocks that we'd collected on these different dives and they were all set up, you know, categorized and labeled. And it was just, it was just so interesting to go in there and see how on every dive we've collected, let's say two to three rocks. And all the rocks are so different that we've collected. A lot of them have similar characteristics, but they're all really different. And so we had them all out on display and we invited the Alvin team to come down and, you know, come visit the museum. I mean, it was just, it was just incredible. Um, the different <laughs> rocks we had and the, the geologist we have on the ship, um, Ken Rubin, you know, he's starting to think of store, like, you know, what do these, what do these rocks tell us in terms of their history, the, the sites, um, and those rocks do tell a story. So that's what the geologists are going to get out of it. Um, for the rest of us, we love collecting the rocks and looking at them and, you know, having somebody who's a professional in that area explain to us what they mean. Yeah. And there he is on Twitter. So anyone out there, uh, Ken H. Rubin. If you're interested in deep sea geology and the early history of the earth and uh, crust formation and the like, um, follow follow away. Um, give you, oh, there's a question that came in that I want to put on the screen too um, from Dina Roberts. How do the shrimp deal with the pressure of living four miles below the surface? I don't know if any of you are dug in enough on the, the basic biology to uh, be able to answer that question. We need our shrimp expert here who's in the other room. Um, they have different adaptations. I, you know, I don't know enough about the shrimp to understand why that they're um, able to survive there. I do know when we bring them up, they don't survive our transit to, um, to the surface. Um, so there definitely are uh, pressure adapted to live there. Um, my understanding is they can't see underwater um, and they're living in this really dark environment. And so they have, have different adaptations to kind of under, like be able to live in that environment. Um, yeah, and actually, you know what? Um, Ernesto from Caymans, I think, has answered the question. This is what I like about the internet. <laughs> Again, the upside, someone is asking a good question and someone's providing an answer. Ernesto Eduardo de Borgana says, uh, I think that pressure is only relative. If creatures are born at a given depth, then that is their normal environment. Water's boiling point is higher. It's good enough for me. And it sounds like... Um, and here's the tail end. Sorry, yeah. again, pressure becomes a problem when there's a difference between internal pressure and external pressure. Um, I, my sense is that it's spot on. Thank you, Ernesto. So, um, we, you know what, we just, just, we just retouched on, we touched again on the idea that this is a certification cruise. This is a cruise just to ensure that Alvin is capable of doing the kinds of scientific work that you're all are looking forward to doing. So what happens next when you get to port? What, what's on the agenda for this vessel uh, in the uh, years ahead? Yeah, and so I just want to be clear, this is actually, a, we're calling this a verification cruise. So they did just do a certification cruise right before us, which is what actually certified Alvin to operate to 6,500 ah. meters. So we're now calling the cruise we just had a verification uh, cruise where we were verifying that the sub was ready to do science. So the, the previous cruise certified the, the vehicle and had it's all signed off that it can operate to 6,500. And then here we were putting the sub through the paces. Uh, doing using it for different types of science. We were testing the capabilities. We use a lot of different sampling equipment. So we were making sure all of that worked along with it. There's a new imaging system on the vehicle. So we were trying that. So there's a series of cruises planned over the next year. Uh, the next cruise that's going to happen um, is going to start 
on about September 1st. Um, it'll be doing work in the Gulf of Mexico, led by PI Dave Valentine, who's from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he'll be looking at steep sites. So if you're not sure what those are after this uh, broadcast, go and look up uh, methane seep sites. And he'll be looking at um, what happens to the, these sites as the methane is transported up. There's a lot of bubble transport. Some of these sites actually have oil. And they'll be looking at what that transport is through the, the water column. They'll be using Alvin to look at that. They'll be using Sentry, which is our AUV, to do some looking for these sites because sometimes they're a little bit elusive. And they'll actually be using some surface um, aircraft. I think they're drones that they're using to look at actually the transport above um, the sea surface. So they'll be doing a multiple different operations on that cruise. Um, that will be again in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's got really important implications that, that methane, how much methane in the ocean ends up in the atmosphere and the like is relevant to climate questions. Yeah. I just found the, uh, some of the work on the seep site. So hold on a second here. I'm just going to throw it up here. more second. It feels like the internet settled down a little bit. I'm really thankful we're able to have an actual conversation. Uh, here's a, oh, this was a, uh, an article, a link, a reference to an article on the methane dragon. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of methane cold seeps around the, around um, the Gulf of Mexico. There's others in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, these sites are, are naturally occurring and um, they can release methane in, in either bubble form, sometimes we see methane seeps coming with um, diffuse flows coming out. And so those are the kind of environments that, you know, Alvin will be looking at next. That's great. So um, Karen, uh, when you get home, how long is it before you do another ship? Uh, a couple days. Really? Yeah. You're, oh, no. you're... Another ship, no, I don't have another ship planned quite yet. Oh, that, would, that, that would be pretty impressive. No, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, my partner, Marley Parker, um, will be on a couple of other ships. She's one who, whose um, beautiful photographs and video you're seeing in some cases um, above the sea surface uh, documenting our crews. And she'll be aboard um, doing Nautilus doing more deep sea exploration within our ROV this time. That's um, great. I'm, I'm, I'm planning my next my next escapades. Huh. And um, Woods Hole is such a glorious place. Um, for those who, I guess Anna Michelle, you're the one here. Do you live right in Woods Hole or nearby? I live in I live in Falmouth. So yeah. um, Falmouth is the town, and in Falmouth we have a variety of different villages, and Woods Hole is a village of Falmouth. So I actually I work right in Woods Hole, but I live in in downtown Falmouth. It's so very close by. Growing up in Rhode Island, we used to sail to, to the to Woods Hole on the way to Cuddyhunk and the little islands there. And it's, it's such an extraordinary place because it really is a science town. There aren't a lot it of. It really those. is. A, it's it's a very a, it's a small town when we think about towns in America, um, yeah. but it has a lot of science for being a being a small town. And Sabrina, Sabrina Douglas, you know when you. Are you heading back to the Caymans or where, where do you go from here? Uh, yes, I fly out from Tampa on Sunday back to Cayman and then back to work on Monday. Wow. So what's your day-to-day -day work like? Uh, a lot of GIS. So my official title is Assistant GIS and Field Support Officer. Uh, so I help my supervisor kind of do all the GIS work for the Department of Environment. And then um, we sometimes we go out and we collect the data. We'll do uh, drone work. Uh, and then if any of the other units within the department need any help uh, doing surveys or whatnot, then they all they can call on me and I'll go out and help them. Uh, every Friday, I'll go out and do a turtle walk with the turtle unit and find their nests and kind of GPS them and uh, collect data on that. So it's a lot of little things that I'm getting um, going through every day at work. Um, I have not been to the Caymans. I'd like to get there someday, but I was in uh, Curacao um, in 2015 or so to make a documentary with some students about coral reef conservation. 
And I learned something really interesting, which is just as true in, in the United States. Uh, in Curacao, at least, very few people have the have had the um, need or uh, or um, downtime to put on a mask and stick their head underwater. So in Curacao, it was understood that conservation of coral reefs would be a lot easier if people could actually see them experience that dynamic and the diversity under 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 the sea. I think in the United States and other countries, if we could see the story behind the fish on our plate in some way or other, we would have a better chance mm -hmm. of conserving the oceans. I recently wrote this piece about the this big oceans conference, and it was like these billionaires keep doing pledges for what to spend money on to conserve the seas. And my vote was on that kind of education, just swimming, <laughs> getting wet, and doing the digital stuff like we're doing here too. And I don't know whether you have your own vision. Uh, maybe we'll, we, we're getting toward the end here. If each of you had some sense of what success would look like, thinking about communication, how much of it is about direct experience? How much of it's about information presented this way if we really want people to engage with the importance of understanding the oceans and protecting them. So, so back to so Sabrina, you know, when you think about kids growing up there who might become you or or Anna or David or or Karen going forward, you know, what what's the kind of thing that's needed? What's the mix that's needed to get that done? And um, a lot of same thing of education, you know, it's I was always loved being on the water. And as I said, I went diving when I was 10 and got certified when I was 10. So it was kind of just being out there. And it was, it was the fun aspect as well. But then you see everything behind it and you see the ecosystem work as a whole. And you kind of learn it. Everything goes from the small guys. just the one little aspect and um, we do education um, within the department uh, we have some great outreaches we just had a thing called coral fest you know and then that kind of gets um, an event out there and people will come and they'll learn about the corals and what's happening about that so it's it's a great um, event that we help we hold and a lot of other events we have as well that's great. Well, the more of that, the better. And I, I, I hope that philanthropists who think about this stuff are thinking about education as a direct need, um, opportunity. Um, here, this was while we were in Curac Curacao, we stumbled on a uh, sl swimming class. And, you know, while we were talking to cor coral reef scientists about the problems with uh, coastal development related to the future of the reefs and stuff, I thought, well, that's just such a great Without more of that, I think we'll still have a hard time doing some of what we're, we're hoping can be done. And uh, Anna Michelle, and then maybe uh, Karen and David, you know, thinking about next steps. Where, where do we go from here in the communication and education you know, I side? I think that the ability to do digital outreach these days, we can share our message much more broadly um, than we used to be able to. Um, I'm an oceanographer because I had an amazing hands-on experience. I went on a cruise in high school um, through Bob Ballard used to do a program called the Jason Project. And he would do these yeah. shows to these different sites around the country. And as a middle schooler, we went every year to the watch the live stream. And this was this was a while ago. This was before uh, you know the internet. And so we would go and watch these live shows. And um, I got the opportunity to go on one of the cruises as a high schooler. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. You know, this wow. is going to be my career path. Um, but the fact that we were able to share, you, you know, these live missions back then, and then now, years and years later, um, we're able to share expeditions and share with people what we're doing. Um, I really think that matters. Um, it got me into ocean science. And so, you know, one of my goals is to always share what we're doing so that other uh, people can be inspired. Um, I'm a female in, in engineering, and there's not many females in engineering, very few underrepresented minorities. So 
really trying to get the message out to a broad audience is really, really important. Um, we want to diversify the field of oceanography and we want everyone to know that this is a field that they can explore and that they can be part of. I just want to add one more thing because I think that the thing we haven't mentioned today is how important the rest of the ship is when all of this. The science is important, but without a the ship and all the crew working hard and all the Al the Alvin group, our crews would not have been a success. So there's different ways to be part of oceanography. You don't have to be a scientist. You know, we've got this great artist with us, um, and but we've got cooks, we've got the captain, we've got oilers, we've got a whole gamut of people out here that are making this a success. So you don't have to be a scientist to be part of ocean science. That's such an important point too. Absolutely. It, it takes a village. It takes a ship is, has so many elements. Uh, all, every science project has all of those components too. That's just, that's a really important thought. And Karen, um, from the standpoint of an artist, you know, the doodle bugging that you do, yeah. we did a session on this webcast on how to be a doodle bug, how to, how to take notes and it seems so important. Uh, when I think, you know, how on social media, sometimes they ask the question, what would you tell your younger self? And to me, it would be mm -hmm. to have kept a better journal. So how, how important is that part of it? Journaling is, is, is really vital. It, it shows that you have a respect for your experience and that you're trying to recall it. And as you say, if you were able to go back and open up the book that you kept when you were 13 years old, you would really have um, a window into that time in your life. Um, one of the things that's been great for me, and I know when I was on your show before, I talked about my method of drawing things that I, I don't know what they are, and then finding out what they are after I've drawn them and already realized some realizations. Um, I, yeah, realized realizations. Uh, realized relationships between things, you know, that thing is a hose, that must conduct some kind of fluid. What is it? And to have the opportunity to go to somebody on the ship and say, explain this machine to me and, you know, show me how it works and show me what this part is and tell me what it's called is, is really valuable and something that anybody um, at any age can get involved in. But even more on this particular cruise, it's been the opportunity to say to different people, what's your role here? What do you see? What experience did you have um, during those years when we know from science that if kids have a good experience with science um, in middle school, early high school, upper elementary years, they're likely or more likely to develop um, a sense that there's a place for science for themselves in science. Um, but also that it's not too late. I've talked to a lot of people who went to, started off at community college or who went back to school after having a child. Um, you know, David can address the idea that it's not too late if you have, you know, changed your mind. He's pursuing his um, his uh, oceanography um, and still out here on the ship looking at the stars through his like these absolutely giant binoculars. So you can use okay. all of your interest at any point in your life. Yeah, that must be particularly nice out there, the, uh, the lack of light pollution, potentially, I guess. So, and David, any last thoughts to, uh, you know, if we were to do this session in 10 years and... Yeah, I think, um, to echo everyone else, I think, um, in, in, I think one of the most important things is, is uh, education, um, but also experiences. Um, my experience was Woods Hole, my oceanographic institution. Um, and uh, that, that got me interested in deep sea research. But, um, but then coming on the ship is, I mean, that's kind of security for me, right? That's, you know, it's, it's, um, I think it's gonna be a lifelong endeavor. Um, so I think education is important, but, and education through experiences also. Um, yeah. For sure. Wonderful. Well, but also, sorry. To say one more thing. It's important. Um, programs like Partnership Education Program, which is what I was part of, and that brought me to Woods Hole the first time. It, those sorts of programs, those um, experiential educational programs, are important for unrepresented groups because I, I wouldn't have gone to Woods Hole otherwise. I, I wouldn't have known about it. You know. Um, so it, it was a it was um, a blessing and a stroke of luck that that my advisor 
handed me the the the, uh, the application form to like apply to this because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be on the ship. So, what was the name of the that program or that uh, partnership education program? Partnership education program. Oh, I see. Is that a Woods Hole initiative that offers kids? It is. Yeah, it's like students at at Hui Noah. Um, MBL and Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, it's intended to diversify um, the Woods Hole Science community. And it's run through the NOAA uh, group there. Yeah. That's just great. Well, the more of that, the better, too. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here and for putting up with the uh, um, my lapses, uh, like not getting you the link to the studio uh, until just before the show and the internet questions. Um, for all the uh, issues we all have with the Elon Musks of the world. It's good that I have the option of being on a satellite connection to the internet here in rural Maine. Uh, so thank you for that, Elon Musk. But there's still, you know, we have too many trees is the problem. We have, I'm not gonna cut down the trees. So that's why the, the connection is not so great sometimes. Thank you all for being here today. This is the uh, Columbia Climate School um, Sustain What webcast. Uh, those of you who have seen this, you can, uh, when we're done, it's all archived. You can trim out the parts <laughs> that were frozen and repost it somewhere on social media yourself. Uh, I'll be trying to do some writing about it uh, on my blog, revkin.bulletin.com. And um, it's great to see the work that Woods Hole is doing, uh, the Oceanographic Institution and the whole community there to um, make uh, this body of science, engineering, and inquiry representative of the world that uh, uh, close to 3 billion people, and not all of, of whom have had the privilege of uh, uh, being able to pursue education or become a, think about becoming a scientist. So, and thanks, Karen Romano Young. If you hadn't reached out, I think this wouldn't be happening. Have a good rest of your cruise back home, and maybe we can revisit this when I'm on a better internet connection sometime, and we're all uh, back uh, on dry land uh, and to explore uh, next steps for this project. This is, uh, this is Andy Revkin signing out, and Thanks to Karen Romano Young, David Doug, uh, Dave, Davis or Douglas, sorry, uh, Dave, D Davis at Rutgers, uh, Sabrina Douglas in, from the Cayman Islands, uh, Dr. Anna Michelle, who's the science expedition and expedition leader. Uh, and again, I'm Andy Revkin. We are. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.